So another championship weekend has been concluded and we have officially reached the halfway stage of the championship season of 2019-2020. This is how the table currently looks. I am going to release my mid-season predictions very soon after Blackburn play Wigan tonight. I'm a bit nervous but I'm aiming to try and get the most correct predictions out of every championship football channel. I'll be happily competitive with any championship footballer to try and get a correct prediction, but I'm not confident, and let me tell you this. Also, before I move on, I want to say thank you to the response I got in my last video. You guys are awesome. You broke some records on that video compared to all my other videos. I'll go through these records in more detail at the end of the video, but I wanted to establish at the start Thank you so much. The response you gave me was so heartwarming. It's encouraged me to do more videos. I feel extra motivated to do a video today. So thank you guys so much for that. We had a bonkers weekend of Championship Football. Let me tell you, a lot of the top sides dropped points this weekend. And we had some unbelievable goals and a lot of last minute goals as well. As of all the Championship Weekend games so far, unfortunately, none of you have got a correct score prediction, which surprised me because there was a lot of predictions in the comments. I only got one correct prediction, that was the Queen's Park Rangers and Charlton game, which ended as a 2 2 draw battle. It was one of the games that had a last minute goal in. I leapt in the air when Nabi Sar scored a goal. I'll talk about it later on. Pretty average weekend from me, nothing too special. But without any further ado, let's move on to what we saw in match day 23 of the championship. So we'll start off with Friday's game between Middlesbrough and Stoke City. And this ended as a 2 1. A home victory to Middlesbrough. I anticipated Middlesbrough were probably going to be in a more stronger side being at home. And I think it did show in the second half more or less. I think in the first half Stoke had the better of the possession. Not necessarily the Charleston fan in the first half. I'd say Middlesbrough went the closest to going to head with Ashley Fletcher. Managed to turn away from Bath. But managed to force a great save out of Jack Butland. But it was a pretty uneventful first half if I'm going to be brutally honest. It looked like both sides were quite low in confidence in trying to score in front of goal. And in the second half, I think continuing on Stoke's possession and it, their slight pressure, they got what they got and they got a goal out of it. It was a pretty fast play with Lee Gregory. McLean forced a fantastic save from Pears, but unfortunately for Middlesbrough, none could pick out Sam Klukas and managed to smash it home. And at that moment, Stoke went ahead and narrowly were ahead of Middlesbrough and were out of the relegation zone. However, the momentum of the game changed completely when Ashley Fletcher managed to score. It was a fantastic pass by Housen, but Tavernier managed to score from a header and what was disappointing with Stoke, no one really picked him out and they tried to play him offside, but I think it was Smith, I think, who played him onside and then that made it 1-1. And then Middlesbrough got ahead by a fantastic goal by Wing. He scored some absolute wonder goals last season and he scored his first goal doing the same. A fantastic bit of play by Tavernier, who managed to leave Jordan Cousins behind, surge through the midfield, great pass to Wing, and then from about 20 yards out or something, just outside the penalty box, shoots it, and Jack Butland couldn't reach it. It was a fantastic goal by Wing, and that proved to be the winner. Middlesbrough won with a bang, quite literally. This result sees Middlesbrough get a little bit of breathing space from the bottom three now, I believe by four points now, which can be a little bit reassuring reaching the halfway stage now with Stoke that actually joined on points as it stands with Wigan and if Wigan get a result against Blackburn tonight they will be 24th at the midway stage which is absolutely shocking and like, out of all the relegated teams I still hand on heart cannot see Stoke getting relegated but we all probably thought the same about Sunderland when they went down. So Stoke have got to be very careful that they do not do the same. Because that squad of players, it's criminal if it ever were to get relegated. So they need to sort something out. Michael O'Neill needs to fix something. Michael O'Neill has been trying a few things tactically and he's not quite got it right recently. Stoke are not in a great run of form. They need to fix that very, very quickly. Otherwise, it will be more increasingly difficult to try and recover and get out of the relegation zone but with Middlesbrough I think their home form is starting to improve I think Jonathan Wigate is starting to get this side playing more confidence at home which is key that could just about be enough for Middlesbrough to 
make a bit of ground and to survive this season. And now to Saturday's early game between Cardiff and Preston, which unfortunately ended as a nil-nil draw, so a little bit of a shame for a neutral. However, it wasn't one of the most boring nil-nil draws. In fact, it was pr a pretty competitive nil-nil draw, actually. I'd say Preston would be more or less the more disappointed team not getting the win out of it because they did have the better chances, I think, in both halves as well. Alan Brown had a couple of chances and Sean Maguire, who's been increasingly frustrated recently, struggling to pick up his form. He hit the side netting in the first half. I'd say Cardiff's best player was actually Bakuna. When he went forward, Preston looked genuinely scared. He was bursting forward with a lot of pace. Him and Tomlin, I think, were creating the most hassle for them. But one of the key moments in the match was when Nelson did an abysmal back pass, let me tell you. And Alan Brown had a lot of time to try and score past Etheridge, but he didn't get a good connection and Etheridge made an easy save. Also in the first half, Billy Bowden had a really good chance, but then Etheridge managed to make a fantastic save as well. Declan Rudd didn't even need to make a save until the 90th minute of the game from Lee Tomlin. But it was a fantastic performance, I'd say, from Ben Pearson. He was instrumental in how Preston was so dominant in this game. I actually sent out a tweet to Ben HD about regarding the Preston performance about Sean Maguire, how he's not really finding his form. And he mentioned about through his injury. Now, whilst I did agree with that, I think there's more to it. If you think about it, Preston are in a position you don't really necess necessarily associate them with. They're in a promotion fight. You know, normally associate them in mid-table purgatory or even in a relegation scrap from last year. They're in a very unusual position. So I think the fact is, is that when you're trying to fight for promotion, tiny things could really make a difference. You know, if your striker's not on form, if it not feeling confident and you're taking chances too soon, it could really be detrimental in terms of your confidence. And I think that's exactly what Sean Maguire is having at the moment. What he needs is one good game. If he has one good game and he recovers from his injury, because I think that does play a part to it, as Ben correctly said, he will then start firing the form. And I think when one player is on fire, the whole team plays around it. So that's just all it is, honestly. It was a really encouraging performance by Preston as well. You could feel it was an opportunity miss because it was a great performance. Cardiff was surprisingly flat, really poor at home, actually. I'm really surprised how little they troubled Preston. And I thought, having one of the best home records, I thought they were going to really trouble them. But they clearly didn't. And actually, the gulf between the two sides was almost scary because they haven't really got that many points to separate them either. But I'd say a poor result for Preston. I'd say a good result for Cardiff managing to hold on for a point because they did defend pretty well, to be fair, despite the back pass. A nil-nil draw, so not one for the spectacle, but overall, the two teams just couldn't be separated. And what a result we got at Craven Cottage. Fulham 2 leads 1. Wow. What? Where do we begin with this? Well, we'll start with the penalty. Ben White conceded the penalty, I think. It looked a tad soft for me, but I think it was a penalty. I think that was the correct decision. Mitrovic stood up and Kassir, despite getting a hand to it, it hit the post and managed to go in. And from the front foot, Fulham went ahead and Leeds were in the back foot. However, Leeds were completely playing their style. They weren't faced by it at all. They were completely carving Fulham apart some stages. Dallas had a good chance, but Rodak had a man of the match winning performance. He made some spectacular saves to keep the score line down and in the advantage of Fulham. He made a great save from Dallas. He made a save where it saved it and then it hit the post as well. Leeds were unlucky not to score that. Eventually he conceded in the second half. When Nketi brought was brought on, he made a huge difference in terms of pace and energy. And he used that to drive through. He forced a save from Rodak and Patrick Bamford in the right place at the right time had a simple tap in. And from then on, it was 1-1. And I say from then on, it was quite an even affair. Caballero had a really good chance for Fulham just before Fulham scored their second. They, he had a really big run in the midfield and had a lot of space. And he tipped a fingertip save for Casilla. But from the resulting corner, Mitrovic wins it, tries to do a side volley, but is not able to do it successfully because it was blocked. But Josh Onoma, with enough space, managed to smash it through the whole defence and pass Kassir. And that was when Fulham went ahead and they managed to hold on for a 2-1 victory. Fulham will definitely take this victory following their pretty poor run of form leading up to this game. With Leeds, I mean... They're still ahead by quite some stage, but you've got to remember this time last year, Leeds had a six-point gap 
from the playoffs with 48 points compared to West Brom's 42 points. They've got a little bit more of a gap with eight points this time, but despite that, you know what Leeds are like. If they don't show their strong form at the start of the season in the second half of the season, they're just going to drop down again, and it would be typical Leeds if they do. But you can't help to deny that Leeds play one of the more attractive style of football in the whole championship with their fluid possession play and the clever amount of passing that they do, the types of passing as well. It is a joy to watch and they've got everything capable of getting promoted, but they've got to keep it up and they've got to stay consistent. The feats like this could really make this side learn their lesson. And if they take the result the right way, but don't come back from it negatively, I think Leeds will be okay and think they can hold on. With Fulham, it's a fantastic win for them because a lot of the top six didn't manage to win this weekend, including Leeds. So in fact, now they're in a very strong position in the playoffs and are now currently in fourth. So a very good result for Fulham this weekend, who I say they were really wanted a result after their poor run of games. So then we had Huddersfield picking up a 2-1 home victory against Nottingham Forest. I think it was a game that Huddersfield did start quite strong actually. It was one of their better home performances from Huddersfield I felt. They've got their first goal following a corner, Steve Mounier with the header which was blocked and Schindler in a very awkward position makes an absolutely brilliant goal, an unstoppable goal stoppable goal managed to just to scoop the ball and hit it right in the roof of the net completely unstoppable and that is how Huddersfield led at half time in the second half Huddersfield continued the same they really put Nottingham Forest under pressure don't think they knew what hit them they went 2-0 up following another corner and it was Steve Mounier again this time getting his header on target and into the goal Bryce Samba made a very uncharacteristic error with that goal he got a palm to it he probably could have done better with that but I think Munia had a lot of space and time, so his header was very, very strong otherwise. Huddersfield could have scored even more in this game. Colin Grant had a fantastic opportunity and had a fantastic shot, but Bryce Samba redeemed himself in a way and managed to save it. Nottingham Forest were uncharacteristically very poor again, like they were against Sheffield Wednesday. They haven't really entered the game until they did score their first, which was from Joe Wowell. Pretty poor defending on Huddersfield Town's part. It was from a corner and he had a huge run up and managed to make a header and managed to get it past Grabera. And as soon as Nottingham Forest scored, they got the confidence and momentum shifted towards them. They had a couple of more chances where Grabera had to make a couple of saves, most notably one for Joe Lolly. But overall, Huddersfield had the game wrapped up. I think one disappointing thing with Huddersfield, I think they should have been more comfortable. They did have quite a few chances in that first half. And I think overall, they should have allowed the game to be more comfortable and should not have let Logical Forest with that many chances to try and get something from this game. But overall, Nottingham Forest is still a very poor run of form. I believe they've not won in their last six games now. So Nottingham Forest will need to start picking a point soon. Otherwise, they will lose ground in the top six. They are currently outside due to other results elsewhere. So they need to start picking up results as soon as they can, in my opinion. Then we had Hull beating Birmingham City by three goals to nil. Well, I can say it was a fantastic performance by Hull. I mean, in the first half, not a lot happened. It was just Hull piling a few chances. They couldn't really get a lot of chances on target, so, though. So it was a bit of a scrappy first half. However, in the second half, that's when the game sparked to life. But Kamal Krasicki, fantastic, a fantastic corner. And Tom Eves managed to header it past Truman. And that made it one goal to nil. Birmingham didn't really respond, actually. And in fact... If anything, they were really faced by it and their two Hull's two further goals were from defence splitting passes and the defending uh, was really, really poor from Birmingham in my opinion. I think what Pep Clotet wanted, they wanted Birmingham to have a load of pressure but what that does is that it brings the high uh, defensive line too high from the ground. So Jared Bowen made a defence splitting pass to put Kamal Grzycki one on one and he did a simple chip past Truman and that made it 2-0 and by then we couldn't really see Birmingham going back into it. In the 87th minute, the 18-year-old Keen Lewis Potter, the Hull homeboy, managed to score and make it 3-0. He was put in a fantastic position and with a little bit of composure managed to start it past Truman to make it three goals to nil. Birmingham, they didn't really trouble George Long in goal and in fact it was probably one of their lesser performances that they've had so far this season and the fact they're struggling now towards the halfway stage they've got to make sure they fix that as soon as they can 
with Birmingham, I consider them to be in a round mid table now, not really pushing for playoffs, but not really fighting for relegation yet. But you've got to be careful if you're on a poor run of form, you can see yourself starting to creep into the relegation bell. So I think Birmingham have got to score capable. Whether the manager is capable enough, it's still yet to be seen. I've seen a lot of people not happy with the performance on Twitter. So maybe Pep Clotin may need to change a few things. But with Hull, it's a fantastic performance in the top half of the table as it stands. And I think they'll be very satisfied with their start so far this season. Then we had Swansea picking up with a way victory against Luton Town. It was not the best game in the world, to tell you the truth. Especially in the first half, there weren't many clear-cut chances that were going to lead to goal. I'd say with Swansea, they're getting a lot of their chances from set pieces. And with Luton, they didn't create all that much going forward. What I've seen in the highlights is that they did have a couple of them choosing in the second half. There was one moment where they were practically put one on one. Woodman went out of his goal and they missed an open net. And it's those opportunities at home that you've got to take. Because at that time, it was, the scoreline was still nil-nil. And if they took it... It could have been a whole different game. And things with Swansea, with the quality that I mentioned in my preview, I said this. With Swansea, well, we all know what we're going to expect with Swansea. They've got a lot of quality in Andre Ayew. He'll be heavily influenced in terms of if they can score. And he was the difference. Andre Ayew scoring the only goal in the game. It came off a deflection and I think it was Jake Bidwell who initially tried to cross it. And he managed to head home and then that is how the game ended 1-0 to Swansea. It wasn't Swansea's best performance by any stretch. They didn't really test Saluga in goal all that much. But a win is a win, and it ends up with Swansea just outside the playoffs now. So Swansea are still in a pretty healthy position. With Luton Town, however, they are now only one point ahead of Barnsley and from the relegation zone. And Luton, having won their last two home games, have now lost this home game. Uh, with Luton, I'm a little bit worried about them. They do look good in parts. The thing is, some of the defending I saw looked really scrap and very desperate. They don't really seem organised and very prepared defensively. In fact, they looked quite terrified if they try and defend anything. So, if they can improve on their defending, I think Luton can be okay because they do have quality. There's no denying about that. But if they can cut off the desperate defending and can be more clinical, I think Luton will be all right. But there'll be a team I'll be looking out for, if, especially if their results don't pick up, because now only being one point ahead of Barnsley, which Barnsley seem to be in a really good run of form right now, they've got to be very careful, otherwise Barnsley could start to overtake them, and they'll be in a really dire position. And speaking of Barnsley, they grind out a 2-1 away victory against Millwall. Millwall having one of the best home records so far this season, with Barnsley having probably the worst array record so far this season, manages to beat Millwall. I mean, I said in my predictions, if you look at the head-to-head, -head, Barnsley have a very strong record against Millwall, actually. So maybe it is written for the stars for Barnsley to try and get an away win now. This could be one of those games where the form book is just thrown out the window and you get a shock result like that. And that is exactly what happened. And Barnsley did have a strong record against Millwall, which I did point out as well. So maybe I should have taken that more into account. Maybe they just really love playing against Millwall. But let's get into the game. I think we expected Millwall to dominate the game. And I feel like they did definitely in possession-wise. But in terms of chances, I'd say Barnsley had the better of them. And following that, Barnsley went ahead through Connor Chaplin. Brilliant play, by the way, by Jacob Brown, who I think has really stepped up for Barnsley recently. He manages to ruffle past the defender, gets it to Chaplin with a first-time shot, hits in the roof of the net. Fantastic finish from him. Chaplin being the man on form at the moment for Barnsley. And that is how Barnsley were 1-0 up. And they were 1-0 up for a lot of the game. Barnsley continued to have chances. Bilkowski was kept quite busy throughout the game. But in terms of the play overall, you would say Millwall did control it. Gary Rowett did have his cards out. He really did try and throw everything to try and punch it through Barnsley. Eventually, it paid off in the 85th minute. Matt Smith rising above everyone, being the six foot four giant that he is, heads it and then O'Brien manages to head it in and to, to finish the job for him. And I thought, there we go, Barnsley have lost it again. Their naivety at the back has cost them a victory again. But how wrong was I? Luke Thomas manages to win the ball back. And then unbelievably in the 95th minute, Patrick Schmidt manages to meet Thomas's pass. 
and manages to score past Bilkowski and that ended 2-1 Barnsley, their first away win. And so far, Gerard Struber has done miracles with his Barnsley side. They're playing with confidence now. They're giving teams a threat. We knew we had they had an attacking threat. We've seen that. It's been frustrating because Barnsley have not been getting results that they've deserved. All of a sudden now, they're getting results that they don't necessarily deserve. But that's the difference. You've got to grind a result and you've got to win even if you're not playing 100% but also to take your chances and that is exactly what Barnsley are doing now which is really really encouraging. With Millwall I don't think this result will affect them too much they're still comfortably in a round mid-table area I think they could still make a chance for the playoffs if they can get a good run of form. I think Gary Rowan may be scratching his head a little bit why his side didn't attack Radinger in the Barnsley goal a little bit more but I think we will, will recover, but more or less, this is more or less a result on Barnsley, who climbed from the bottom of the championship to 22nd, only one point out of safety. Gerard Stuber, take a bow. Well done, my son. And then the one score I managed to predict correctly was the London derby, Queen's Park Rangers 2, Charlton 2. It was West London going against East London here. It was a fantastic game in the highlights. Literally, it was so head-to-head -head and open. Each team were taken in turns in terms of chances. Queensborough Rangers managed to draw first blood following a fantastic free kick from Eberichi Eze. Charlton tried to clear it, but then it fell to Jeff Cameron, who manages to slot it through Phillips in the 18-yard box. You could have argued that Queensborough Rangers should have been 2-0 up after Naki Wells managed to hit the bar, and that got to 1-0 at half-time. Charlton in the second half came back into it with Lyle Taylor managing to gain, be on the score sheet again as he recovers from his injury. It was a bit of a deflected goal and he was in the right place at the right time. The shot was originally from Morgan, but Lyle Taylor managed to get the tap in because he was played on side. So that made it 1-1. And then Naki Wells. What? <laughs> Lockyer does a terrible back pass to Naki Wells. He is one-on-one -on -one with Phillips. And he misses and Phillips saves it. That could have changed the overall outcome of the game. I, some of the chances both of these sides missed, I could not believe what I was seeing. Lyle Taylor also hit the woodwork in the second half as well. He was really unlucky not to score. Especially as just before that, Queen's Park Rangers managed to take the lead under Mark Pugh. Some fantastic play by Bright Samuel actually. Imagine to shrug off at Pierce and managing to give it to Pugh for a simple tap-in. So... By then, Queen's Park Rangers were in ascendancy. Lyle Taylor hitting the post, you'd think Queen's Park Rangers could hold on. But you've got to wait till the 96th minute. Jeff Cameron heads it back, but it heads it back to Naby Saar, who Saar actually made the error leading to the first Queen's Park Rangers goal, managing to score to make it 2-2. So both a goal scorer for Charlton and Queen's Park Rangers had a goal and an error leading to goal as well. So... A very equal and very even affair between the two. What's been Charlton's biggest disappointment is conceding late goals. But now, Queen's Park Rangers caught that very curse. They conceded a very late goal that denied them the win. And Charlton had to use it to get something from this game. Overall, it's disappointing for Charlton still that they haven't managed to win. If they'd have won, they probably could have got a little bit of breathing space from the relegation places. But they're still in the relegation scrap, in my opinion. I think they need to start picking up results soon because of the longer this win this streak goes on for, it's going to be even harder to try and pick yourself up from it. Chris Bar Rangers, they've been in rocky form themselves. They're not winning as consistently as they were in the beginning of the season. But I still think they can make a reasonable finish to the season if they can pick up their form because they do have fantastic quality players. But I don't think Queen's Power Rangers can deny that they secretly would have really, really wanted this win. And then what a fantastic result for Reading. They managed to get a 3-0 home victory against Derby County. And the game was ultimately decided from the opening minutes of game when Scott Malone managed to get sent off by pushing Yakumete in the penalty box. I think it was red because of how rash the push was and how rough he was towards Yakumete, but I don't know if it's red card offence, but I think it was because it was denying a scoring goal scoring opportunity. Charlie Adam was the one that managed to score the penalty. He made it 1 0 to Reading. I know Derby continue their poor away form. I think it's now six away games that they've not won in now, but they did have chances. Tom Lawrence. Must be feeling very unlucky after this game because he hit the post twice. Once in the first half, 
and once again in the second half, which both would have been fantastic goals if they did go in. Black hit for Reading also made a fantastic goal line clearance as well. So Reading weren't as comfortable as you may suspect. However, the two remaining goals they did score, one was from Lucas Jow, which was a fantastic assist by John Swift, probably Reading's best par for play with Ajaria to Swift and then to Jow. It was a fantastic combination and it split Derby apart and Ben Hamer couldn't save it. And then once again, Reading got another penalty with a very, very silly challenge and Yaku Meite this time scored the penalty and that made it 3-0 to Reading. I think Reading will be very happy with this win following their pretty poor run of form leading up to this game with Derby. Their poor run of form still continues. They, if they're not careful, they could be in a scrap, which is disappointing with the quality of the squad they've got and the stature of the manager that they have. Wayne Rooney is going to have to work miracles if they want to try and get Derby up competing again because right now I'd say they're more in a relegation scrap than they are in mid-table purgatory at the moment. But Reading this win came at the right time in my opinion to end on a high before the halfway stage and they can probably try and resume their pretty positive start to the season with Derby they're gonna have to improve quickly. And then a very exciting game happened at the Hawthorns with West Brom managing to be, get held by Brentford by one goal each and both goals scored were actually very identical. Brentford managed to score third by the Salgard, managing to head from a corner. However, Furlong did something very similar three minutes later and by half time it was 1-1. And I say this goal was much needed for West Brom. If Brentford had gone ahead at half time, Brentford could have been really comfortable and would have controlled the game. Brentford were really brave against West Brom and actually really took the game to them. West Brom were pretty shocked, I think, with how well Brentford played. West Brom did have a goal disallowed from Charlie Austin. I think it was a little bit offside and that could have ultimately changed the whole dynamic if West Brom were to win this game, but they didn't and then they have to share the points. So I think it was deserved. I think Brentford did have quite a fair few chances. West Brom did have some chances of their own. It was a fantastic game, very competitive game game both sides could have won at some stage both deserve to be as high as they are on the table West Brom despite not winning actually do extend their lead from Leeds by three points now so that could be very important for them in the future with Brentford with this draw they're still in or around the playoff places and I'd say now they've got half their games out of the way and, and now they're in this position I'd say they need to try and continue this form and if they can I think they could be a real team to look out for for the playoff places because I think they've really got the potential and the squad for it I think it's really talented and then yesterday's game which ended as a 1-0 home victory to Sheffield Wednesday Sheffield Wednesday needed this win following what they could face in their terms of their breach of financial fair play or the financial rules or something following the sale of Hillsborough from their owner. They need to pick up as many points as they can. If they do get a points deduction, they need to collect as many points as they can so they could be safe. They could even receive more points than Birmingham did last year when they received a nine point deduction by breaching the financial fair play rules, I think. So in terms of picking up points, they need, they're doing that and it's really key that they are. It's a shame because honestly, if they didn't have this deduction, I think they could have been a real favourite to try and get into the playoffs and potentially gain even promoted because they are third place at the moment, the closest team catching leads. Sheffield Wednesday's only goal came from a penalty and I think it was a little bit on the soft side for me, but I understand why it was given and Barry Bannon managed to score it and that made it 1-0. Fingers with Bristol City, at times they were in some fantastic positions in this game, but they just did not have the hunger, the clinical nature to try and punch it through the defence. Sheffield Wednesday did have chances of their own. I think they were slightly stronger than Bristol City overall, although Bristol City probably had better chances. Barry Bannon had a great free kick, which was saved by Bentley near the end of the second half. And I think overall, I mean, in the first half, it was a bit disappointing. There weren't any shots on target in the first half. It was only in the second half where they knew that one of the teams needed to get something out of this game when they started to really compete. And it turns out Sheffield Wednesday managed to get their way with a pretty soft penalty decision. So it's one of those things. It's the tiny margins, as I've already mentioned with Preston, that could really make teams in a great position to be promoted. So I think Sheffield Wednesday would definitely take this win with Bristol City. They could be on a winless streak right now. They need to pick themselves up and to make sure they end that streak as soon as they can because I do think they are capable enough to gain in the playoffs, definitely. So here's a rerun of the table at the halfway stage. 
West Brom and Leeds in the promotion places. So West Brom and Leeds are the favourites to be promoted as it stands. Sheffield Wednesday, Fulham, Preston and Brentford are the four teams occupying the playoffs. Swansea and Bristol City just outside the Bristol City. They're now two points behind Brentford. So they've got to be really careful they don't drop any more points. Nottingham Forest and Blackburn, only a couple points further behind. But Blackburn do play Wigan tonight if they win. They'll be joining on points with Brentford. So they could potentially get to the playoffs. Cardiff are just outside. Hull are just outside as well. Millwall are just outside as well. So it's very tight. Then obviously down the bottom you've got Reading, Derby on 26. Charlton, Huddersfield on 25. Middlesbrough on 24. That goes to show how close the relegation battle is as well. Both sides of the table are really, really close. So it's really intense that you've got to fix really poor runs of form and Luton are only one point outside of the relegation zone with Barnsley now at 22nd off from 24th Wigan are the team in 24th but if they get a good result against Blackburn it'll be Stoke that face the bottom of the table after the halfway stage so that wraps up all my results as I said I wanted to say thank you to you guys from my last video you broke so many records from the response of my last video You've got the best performing stats in the first 12 to 14 hours I've ever had. Gained like over 500% of what I'd normally get. The most liked video on my channel as well. So about the lighting, my camera actually ran out of data. And whilst I was fixing that, it's now too dark. So I've had to put the light on. But as I was saying with my thank you, I've gained the most subscribers I've had in one video ever. As it stands, I think the last time I checked... I gained nine, six on the release of the video, which is out of this world for me. Two on the Saturday, the day after, and one on the Sunday. Just that sort of momentum really, really made me heart warm. It really, really did. And I can only thank you guys, honestly. I didn't expect this reaction. Didn't get the most comments in the world, but in terms of the like and the subscriptions that I got from that video, really, really meant a lot to me. It really did. And I don't know what it was. Maybe I need to do more football analysis when I'm hungover. Maybe that's the way I need to do it. Maybe I should need to go out clubbing more often. But with all jokes aside, thank you guys so much for that. Really, really made my week, actually. And it's going to encourage me to make more videos, definitely, for sure. I've got a lot more stuff planned. I'm a little bit busy around the Christmas time, but I've got stuff planned. So stay tuned for that. But that'll wrap it up for this video. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you guys liked what you see and you want to see more, Make sure you do give the video a like. Share the channel to grow the community. We would like a strong, humble community. And if you comment, 95% of the chance I will reply to it with a heart because I love you guys. And subscribe if you haven't and if you're new around here. All of that would be tremendously appreciated. But thank you guys so much for watching. You guys are legendary if you saw the end of this video. And as always, take care.